can see the clouds rolling I can feel the winds They try to shake me I will not be moved My feet are on the rock If you guys are in the house, you can have a seat. If you're at your house, you can do what you want because you're at your house. But I want to say thank you for tuning in, making us a part of your New Year's weekend, whether you're here online. Thank you for being here. If you're catching up a little later in the week, thanks for tuning in and catching up with us there as well. My name is Trent. I'm one of the pastors here at Northfield where our mission is simple. Our mission is to love God, love people, and make Jesus known. It's why we exist as a church. It's why we gather together. It's why we do good in our community is to make that name of Jesus known above all else. As we jump in today, I got a couple of things for you that are going to involve your smartphones, if you want to go ahead and get your smartphone out, the first is you can leverage your social media account to do a little bit of good in the world simply by checking in on Facebook or Instagram. On Instagram, you can location tag there and add it. And when you do that, you're partnering with Souls for Souls to help provide warm winter coats for some children in need. And so at any point today, feel free to check in and do good. If you want to quote something from the message, you can. If you want to take a selfie with the person beside you, you can. Even if you don't know the person beside you, you can still take a selfie with them. That's, you know, making new friends. That's, that's maybe your New Year's resolution in 2022. That's just how to do it. And so just take a selfie with them, put it on Instagram and say, hey, we're providing coats this, this day. That's, that's what we're doing. So uh, at any point today, feel free to check in and know that you are doing good. Also, I want to point you out to our digital connection card. If you're right here in the house, there's a little QR code in front of you that you can scan and find that. If you're watching online, you can go to our website at northfieldchurch.net slash connect. There's a little link probably below me right now that you can see. And you can access that digital connection card. That connection card
Lord is the on-ramp to all things Northfield. So if you're looking for ways to serve in this new year, we have opportunities for you to serve. If you're looking to find your people, if you're looking for a little more community in 2022, we've got that for you as well. Really, anywhere that you want to leverage and move forward with your spiritual walk, we want to partner with you in that and help you in any way that we can. And so there's a couple opportunities that you can find right there on that digital connection card that'll help you get plugged in or help you get involved in serving in some way. Well, hey, I'm glad that you guys are here and a part of what we're doing this weekend to kick off the new year strong. So I want to invite you to get on your feet because we're going to sing a song that talks about this united connection that we all have. And that as you look across the room, there may be strange faces. There may be people that you don't recognize. There may be people that you don't even know. Yet in this, what we're going to declare together is that through Jesus, well, we can all be one. We can all be considered close to one another and like family to one another, not because of anything that we've done, but because of what God has done to unite us. And so let's ring in the new year in this way that declares who God is and who we are as a part of that and who we are together in view of him. Sing out. Children, clean hands, your hearts, good face, 
wonder of how you brought deliverance, the exodus of my heart. You found, you freed, held back the waters for my release. Oh, Yahweh, see you're the God. You're the God who fights for me, Lord of by day, a cloud by day, is a sign that you are with me, the fire by night, is the guiding light to my feet, oh, you found, you feel me, held back the waters for my release, oh yeah.
guys can have a seat. Uh, if you didn't get a communion cup on your way in, if you want to wave around, there's some folks that are willing to help you out and get you one of those. If you're tuning in with us online, we'd love for you to join us in this moment as well. But finish this sentence. New year, new New year, new me. Undoubtedly, we're two days in to 2022, and you've probably heard that phrase already. You may have even said it yourself because this is the time of the year. This is that focal point where we say, this is where I want to improve. This is where I want to improve in this new year. This is going to be the year that I finally run that marathon, or this is going to be the year that I take a break from social media. This is going to be the year that I'm going to, and we fill in the blank. And I'm not knocking our New Year's resolutions by any means at all, okay? I'm all for New Year's resolutions. In fact, how many of you have already set a New Year's resolution for 2022? Anybody? Got some hands in the air. You see, for me, as I look at New Year's resolutions, and especially as this phrase of New Year, New Me, well, as we do this, I have some news for you. That on the surface, you may not think it sounds like good news, but I promise you, it is. But the news that I have for you is this. <laughs> New year, same you. Sorry. New year, same you. Because the same you that you were three days ago is the same you who you are right now and the same you that will walk through this new year. Now again, don't get me wrong, I'm not knocking all of the ways that you want to improve yourself. I think that is wonderful. But. I sometimes know what it is like to live and seemingly die by the success or the failures of our New Year's resolutions. Because again, show of hands, how many of you have failed a New Year's resolution? You see, it has a way of messing with your head. It has a way of making you feel like maybe you weren't as good as you thought you were, or you're not as good as you had hoped that you would be, and so therefore you feel like you're stuck in this reality of where you are. But let me ask this, how many of you have completed or successfully achieved a New Year's resolution? That's amazing. It's a wonderful feeling. The sense of accomplishment is good for us. And Again, it does something to our mental state that helps us think that that we are doing better, that we're being more successful. And in this, well, then God must be more in favor of me because I have succeeded or because I have done well. And the reality is whether we succeed or whether we fail miserably in our New Year's resolutions, it does not change one bit the way that God feels about you. You hear this? <laughs> Whether you succeed or you fail miserably, it does not change the way that God feels about you. So, new year, same you, but here's the reminder, especially this reminder that we get through this moment that we call communion, that although it is a new year, same us, this moment of communion is a reminder that it is new year, same made new me. That through the saving work of Jesus, we can be considered righteous that we can be looked upon with favor from God, not because of what we have done for ourselves, but because of what Jesus has done on our behalf. And so in this moment of communion, this is what we do, is we find ourselves in the present and we draw back upon what God has done in the past through Jesus. And in doing so, It allows us to look upon our futures, not with a sense of, I hope so, not with a sense of, well, God did it before and so maybe he'll do it again. But in this moment of communion, what we're able to do is we're able to draw from the past and look ahead towards our future with a sense of hope and with a promise that the God who is who he says he is will make good on the promises that he's made. And so, In this time of communion, we tangibly remind ourselves of God's previous faithfulness. We do it through a small piece of bread and a little cup of juice. And so I wanna invite you, if you haven't already, to take the bread and to eat it. (laughs) 
and in the same way, to take the cup and to drink it. Because that small piece of bread, it's a reminder of the physical body that Jesus took on when he took on flesh and he moved and he walked and he lived among us. And that cup of juice, well, it's symbolic of a sealed promise that God has made to be with us and to be for us for eternity. I don't know what battles you may have faced in 2021 that may be creeping into 2022 along with you. I don't know what the future holds for each of you, but what I do know is I know the God who holds the future. And his name is Jesus. And he is the God that is with us, a God that is for us always. So as you stand and as we declare in this next song, that although we may see a battle within our midst, the God who fights with us and the God who fights for us, well, he only sees a victory because that's what's in his name. So if you will, stand and let's sing. Oh 
So Father, as we fight, we will fight on our knees. I thank you, Father, that you go before us, that you go behind us, that, Father, that there's nothing in this world that can separate us from you, that you fight every battle, that, Father, you not only fight it, but you have won the war. I thank you for doing for us what we could not have done for ourselves. Father, I pray that we will be a people who continually lean on you, that we look back at the battles that you have fought and won in the past, and that it will remind us that we have a God who is faithful for the battles that we face in the future. Father, I pray that you would heal our land, that you would heal our world, and that you would draw us as a country and as a people and a church closer to you. I pray you would speak through the words of this message as you have spoken through the words of this song. And we ask this in the powerful name of Jesus and the whole church said. Amen. Hey, well, you may be seated. Let me echo Trent's words of Happy New Year. Whether you're in the house with us today, whether you're viewing online, or whether you are viewing sometime in the days or the weeks to come, I'm just happy that you turned in, tuned in this morning. You know, I'm excited about giving you an update on where we are with our greater vision. If you remember, the greater vision was built around this uh, verse that Habakkuk the prophet gives. You know, he's a guy who's living in the Old Testament. Uh, he he lives in the shadow of the great things God has done in the past, but he is looking for the future. And he makes this comment, which really becomes a prayer. He says, Lord, we have seen what you have done in the past, and we ask you, would you do those things again? Would you do great things in our own days? And that became kind of the, the verse behind our greater campaign, which really started a, a year ago. We talked about the Summer Center. It was really an Acts 1 type of thing where Jesus looked at his disciples and said, you're going to be a difference makers. You're going to spread this news of the message to Jesus, not only in your hometown of Jerusalem. He said, it's going to go beyond there. It's going to go into your community, which to them was Judea. It's going to spread beyond that. It's going to go into Samaria. Samaria were those places that are not like you. They don't have the same traditions. They don't have the same customs. Uh, they just don't look the same. They don't act the same. You're going to take it to those places. And he said, guess what? This message that you're a part of, it's not going to end there. It's going to go to the entire world. Well, we have been praying for God to do greater things. About mid-November, we kind of told you where we wanted to go this year, kind of following up on the opening of the Summer Center and getting that off the ground and running. We said through Hope Springs that uh, we wanted uh, to uh, be a part of bringing clean water to over 50,000 people in this coming new year. If you don't know about Hope Springs, they're a ministry based right here at Northfield Church. Uh, they operate primarily in the countries of Chad, Africa, Nigeria, Africa, and Nigeria. They started out really uh, with kind of a clean water operation, but they have expanded to so many different areas. And we wanted to be a part of that expansion. So it started with saying, how could we help bring clean water and dig wells that would impact the lives of at least 50,000 people? We looked to construct a building that would hold two classrooms that would help ease maybe the burden over right now 1,300 orphans from the village who come and are a part of us teaching them English and Bible and different languages and um, uh, so many different things. We said that we wanted to fund a trip back to Africa this year for not only Lee, but one of our own members as well. And we said we wanted to provide some of the overall support for Hope Springs. We also said that we wanted to help address the issue of home affordability in Sumner County. And working through Habitat for Humanity, we said we wanted to be Habitat for Humanity. There we go. We said we wanted to be one of the first churches uh, in, in our area that would step up and say, you know what? We will we'll not only help, we will support an entire home for someone in this county who is working to provide a home for themselves and they just need a little bit of a boost. We also said we wanted to fund the entire operations of the Sumner Center. That uh, in looking at that organization, for those of you who may not know what it is, we just opened it this past year, but we have been working throughout the past year. We didn't wait for it to open to, to kind of start in there. But it's a center based around the idea that uh, we want to move people who are simply surviving to where they are thriving. It would include a lot of different services. We talked about it and we said through the Sumner Center, we want to address the challenges of families who have 
have food insecurities. They're not just hungry, but every month they make decisions on whether I'll buy food this month, whether I'll pay for medicine, whether I'll have gas to go somewhere else. That what if we could take one of those things off the table for them and provide food? Would it help that family out? We also said we want this center to be a place where we think not only about families who may have a place to take their food if we have it, but what about those people who don't? What about homelessness in Sumner County, which uh, are really, uh, as opposed to maybe Davidson County, where most of the homeless people that you think of, they actually live on the streets. Most homelessness in Sumner County is people who live in hotel rooms week by week, or people who live in their cars uh, in parking lots around our city. There are a few in the traditional sense of which we feel homeless, but they don't have places to cook the food that we provide. What would food for those people look like? What would it look like to provide dental care for adults who aren't covered by uh, state or federally funded programs? What would it look like to provide legal counseling to people who need just a, a little boost in their next step? I'm not sure what to do to be able to, uh, to get onto this program or to figure out how I'm going to get help. What about financial classes for people who are struggling to learn how to make a budget, how to live within what they have, educational supplies, all of those things. We thought as a church, those seem to be basic human things that if we really lived out our mission to love God and to love people, that we would seek to provide those things for people. So the Sumner Center was built around this idea that if we loved our neighbor like we loved ourselves, well, we would seek to provide those things for them. So we sought through this year in greater vision to, uh, to fund that Sumner Center for an entire year. We also said, what about this message we preach? We knew the infrastructure from purchase in this building was, uh, was kind of the, the same infrastructure they had before, but we wanted to be able to send uh, the, the messages and send what we were doing and, and really uh, make this more than just a local thing. But, but what would it look like going into the future to spread our arms a little bit more? Well, we knew we were gonna need to update our internet, our security and different things like that. So we wanted to fund that. And then the last thing kind of on this list uh, uh, that, that we had funds for, that we, or that we wanted to raise funds for, we said we want an all-inclusive playground. A playground that would help us uh, in our efforts to continue to expand what we were doing with the community of people who experience special needs in their family. Not only through Night to Shine, but through Gigi's Playhouse, uh, through the Special Needs Foundation that uses our gym on different occasions. What would it look like to go a step further where uh, mom and where dads and where families would be able to come and all their children play in one place and be kind of a, just an all-inclusive place. Well, we looked at all that and kind of got some preliminary estimates and that was gonna cost right at a million dollars to happen. And uh, uh, it seemed like a daunting figure, but we were kind of up for the challenge. And then one of our own uh, members, Susan, uh, Sue Noakes, uh, stepped forward and through the foundation she created, the Susan G. Noakes Foundation, she said, you know what? She said, let's just take kind of half of this off the table. She said, through my foundation, if you guys can raise the 500,000, we will raise the other 500,000. We will make it happen. And so through a generous matching grant, through them, we thought we need to raise uh, at least half a million dollars. And if we could go beyond that, anything beyond that, we would use to try to solve uh, kind of what's happening at our 930 service. If you were at our 930 service, you know that it is generally packed, that uh, our classrooms are packed in the back, and we would start a fund to figure out where we're going to go with that. But so to date, through 1231, what it was that Friday night? Was that, was that December the 31st? I think it was Friday night. And you know, I said a few weeks ago, I kind of make a joke. You can get online if you want to at 1159 at night and make a contribution. There were people, there were like three people at 1159 in so many seconds online Friday night who, who made a donation to get it in just under the wire. But not counting the match money, you guys to date have raised Nine hundred and one thousand eight seventy eight sixty four, which I think is incredible. When you add to that those matching funds of five hundred thousand, that brings our total to one million four hundred and one thousand dollars. Absolutely incredible. A, a four hundred thousand jump start into uh, what's coming next in our greater vision. This family is one of the most generous church families that I have ever been a part of. And I just want to say thank you. And I thought we would be amiss in this season not to pause and thank God for the blessings that uh, he has provided through each of you in the lives that you, uh, that you live. So would you pray with me? Father, uh, I just thank you. 
I thank you for being a God who does exceedingly abundantly above everything that we could ask or imagine. I thank you, Father, for the the people who are able to to put in what we see as large amounts and to challenge us. And I thank you, people, for the I thank you, Father, for the for the people who uh, who go to work and, and they make minimum wage and they come back and they put something in there. Father, I thank you that you took all of us together that you took all of us from different walks of life, from different places in our life, and that you worked greater through us. And I pray, Father, that we will be a church who continually looks at not only how we can bless ourselves, but how we, Father, can live out the mission, Father, that you gave us to love our neighbors like we love ourselves. And so, Father, I pray that we will be a church that looks to our home, that looks to our community, and looks to our world, and looks at it in the eyes and with the eyes of our Savior Jesus. Thank you for what you did. Thank you for not only your son, but thank you for how his influence has influenced us to give far beyond what we think or what we could do. I pray you will continue to do that, that you will continue to use us. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, you know, when I was thinking about what to start in 2022, well, what series, what series do you start? Do you start about something, do you go to the Old Testament, you go to the New Testament, where do you begin? Well, I couldn't help but begin, maybe through some readings I was doing in, in my private to daily devotionals, I couldn't help but think about the time that Jesus called those first disciples. It's early in his ministry and there are new beginnings. It's not only kind of new beginnings for Jesus, it's new beginnings for the people who are gonna make the decision to follow Jesus. And while we don't know when he called those first disciples, if it was the beginning of a new year, we do know it was the beginning of something new for them. It was the beginning of a new walk in their life, a new phase of doing things, a new chapter in their lives. And their world was a lot like, or their world, yeah, was a lot like our world is. It has its ups and it has its downs. It has its joys. It has its sorrows. And at the time Jesus comes on into the scene or breaks in, people are looking for something new. They're tired of being under the tyranny of Rome. They're tired of the Roman occupation of their land. They're actually tired of a religious system that seems ought to be all about feeding themselves and not reaching out. It leaves this hole, this empty place in their lives. They, like many of you, are just ready for something new. Anybody ready for something new in 2022? Something that's maybe a little bit better, a little bit more exciting than kind of the last uh, couple of years have been? Ah, I heard somebody about to clap. I am, uh, I am praying about that as well. Every, every day in my prayers, I pray that God will bring healing not only to our land, but to our entire world. Well, if that, if that sounds like you, if that is something that you've been uh, uh, praying about, something you've been hoping for, then I think that Luke has an incredible message for us today. There's a person that both Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all tell us about. His story is found in almost every book in scripture. There are pieces written about him, but his calling came at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. That calling is kind of detailed for us in the books of Matthew and the books of Luke, but since Luke gives us a little bit more detail into his story, that's kind of where I wanted to land today. His name when we first meet him is Simon. Jesus will later change his name from Simon to, anybody know? Peter, that's right, which meant rock, which meant firm, which meant, uh, you know, stands and does it back down. Now that's not Peter or Simon when we meet him, but Jesus saw in Peter, Jesus saw in Simon something that he could be. Well, this initial calling happens around the seashore. It's detailed for us in Luke chapter five, beginning in verse one. Luke records it this way. One day as Jesus was standing by the sea of Galilee, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. It's early in Jesus' ministry, yet there are lots of people who are wanting to see him. And on this occasion, Luke wants to know that he's not only surrounded by a crowd of people, but that this crowd of people are crowding Jesus. That word crowding, in many of your translations, is actually translated pressing, and that's more the word. The idea that Luke is trying to tell you is that this crowd is trying to not only hear Jesus, they're trying to touch Jesus. They're trying to get next to Jesus. It's the same meaning that's going to happen in Luke chapter 8 just a few chapters later when Luke tells us about this lady who is sick and she wants to get into the presence of Jesus but because of the crowd she was not able to do so. Luke says that she pushes 
her way through the crowd. Well, it's the same word that Jesus is using here. It is a crowd so great that if you're going to get to Jesus, you're going to have to push your way and make your way through the crowd. They're not in an auditorium like this, sitting in chairs and sitting in rows, listening to Jesus speak. They're not sitting as the picture I get in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, you know, the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus, uh, the, they're on a hillside. I picture little groups of people here, little groups of people here, and Jesus kind of teaching these groups of people. Not even when you read in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John of Jesus feeding the 5,000 men, let alone the women and children. So upwards 15, maybe 20,000 people out there in front of him. When he has the people sit in groups of 50, there's no organization like that going on right here on the Sea of Galilee. Luke wants you to know that their people are not only standing, but they are pushing, they are crowding in on Jesus. They're pressing in on him. If it were a concert and a celebrity in our day and age, someone would have called for a bodyguard. It would have been the people who were standing just behind the pit area. If you've ever been to a concert and, it, and it's, you know, one that's got a lot of young people and they are, you know, something big is about to happen and there are people in that pit area. But then there are people who are standing on the ground behind that. And as that celebrity comes out, they're pushing closer. And, and that's where security kind of comes in a little bit to make sure they don't get too close and everything. That's the picture I think that Luke wants us to give. They're crowding around Jesus, but Jesus has no bodyguard. He has no fences that are holding the people back. He has no stage where he is elevated kind of apart and kind of safe from this crowd. For Jesus, this tremendous group of people have pushed and pressed and crowded against him so much that they have backed him up against the Sea of Galilee where he has nowhere on dry land to turn. Why would they be that way? Well, rumor has it that this Jesus is the Messiah that they have been waiting on. The Messiah that they have longed for, for not hundreds, but thousands of years that their fathers and their fathers before them have told them about. Could this possibly be the one who was coming from Abraham's seed who would bless? Now, the prophecy was that he would bless all nations, but in their minds, they're worried about their nation. Could this be the one who's going to bless us? Who's going to get us out of the tyranny of Rome? Who's going to take us and restore us to the glory days that we had during the days of King David and King Solomon? They're worried about their nation. And for all they don't know about this carpenter who has turned rabbi, the one thing they do know is this, is that when Jesus shows up, lame people are walking. When Jesus shows up, blind people are seen. When Jesus shows up, dead people are living again. When Jesus shows up, sick people are getting well. There's something different about this guy that the crowd isn't calmly sitting, waiting on Jesus. No, they are pressing up against him, pressing him back up against the Sea of Galilee. And I know that's how all of you got up ready to come to church this morning, wasn't it? I mean, you were up at 4 a.m. thinking, I gotta get there today. I mean, I can't even sleep. I got to get the kids ready. I got to get the dogs outside. I got to get all this done. I got to get supper on because there's going to be a time we're going to come back and we're going to get in the car because there's going to be so many there pressing against people to see Jesus that we got to get everything ready. We got to prepare for this moment. And you laugh about that because you know why you laugh about it, don't it? Don't you? Because that's not the way it really happens in the Jesus world anymore, is it? I mean, that's the way it might happen if we're getting ready to go to a concert or a football game or I don't know what it was, kind of a sad commentary. Not so much on the church, because I think the church still gets excited about what happens in the lives of people. But doesn't it seem like our world has kind of turned a corner some days? Turned a corner where nobody is excited anymore about the coming of Jesus into somebody's life? I love reading about a time and, and maybe it even inspires me and if it could inspire you in 2022 to once again to, to pray that people would look forward to the coming of Jesus into their lives, that our country, that our world would be a country who would look forward, who would actually get up with anticipation that God is about to do something above what they could think or even imagine. Well, I digress. Jesus is standing at the shore of the Sea of Galilee. Now, the Sea of Galilee in Israel was a, was a freshwater lake in Israel. It was about 13 miles long. It was about seven miles wide. And fishing was big on the Sea of Galilee. Both Herod and Philip, who are mentioned in Scripture primarily, they made a lot of their money off of the fishing trade. Rome made them pay taxes on the fish that they would catch. So it was an, in, uh, an industry. And the, the, the boat that Peter gets in, we, all, we often think when we, when we think 
think about fishing on the Sea of Galilee, uh, and we think about the fishermen who were there, the, the boat that Simon would have had on this occasion would probably have been somewhere around 23 to 25 feet long. It would have been about seven feet wide. It would have held probably four people who would have been rowers on the boat. It actually even had a place, if you remember in scripture, there's a, there's a time when Jesus is gonna use the boat, they're crossing the same sea, and Jesus is in a different part of the boat sleeping. So we're not talking about just a little Jesus rowboat. We're talking about a pretty big size boat for that day and age on the Sea of Galilee. The historian Josephus records that at that time, there were over 230 fishing businesses within the Jewish community alone that operated on the Sea of Galilee. And that's where Jesus is on this occasion. And he's been backed up to this body of water in this fishing village. And we continue in verse two. He saw, which makes me think, what in the world did he see? What in the world, when you look at Jesus and he's pressed in with people on his right, he's pressed in with people on his left, he has people in front of him. The only place where there are no people is behind him at this moment, except the other boats who may be out there in the water. What in the world with a crowd, a lot, a crowd like that around you, what in the world would Jesus notice? He saw at the water's edge, two boats left there by their fishermen. He saw at the water's edge, two boats left there by their fishermen. And as you and I will discover, what Jesus saw were the leftovers of a guy who had spent his entire night trying to make a living, but coming up short. And in the middle of this crowd who have not only crowded in and are pressing in on Jesus, not only did Jesus see the two boats, as we will discover, he saw the men that the two boats belonged to. And as I begin to think just about this one little passage, and in particular, these two words, I wonder who it is online that's watching this morning or watching sometime this week. And you're not online today because you were physically ill. You're watching online today because you're at the point of giving up. You're like Simon. You've had a night where you've tried, maybe you've even had a season where you've tried to make things work out and things just seem to be out of control. Things aren't working out the way you thought they would work out and something inside you said, I'm just gonna stay home right now. But something made you tune in and tune in online. Not only the people who are watching online, but I thought about the people who are in the house because in a crowd and spread over three different services, there are people to your left, there are people to your right. And I hope as you pulled in the parking lot this morning, I hope that one of our parking lot people waved at you. <laughs> I hoped as you walked in this morning that somebody opened a door for you, that somebody said hello to you, that, that somebody made a point to say something to you. But even in a space like that where we try to make those things happen, I know that there are people who still will leave here and feel alone. That you will leave here and feel, does anyone or wonder if anyone really sees you? If that is you, then I think Luke is bringing words of encouragement this morning. That even though the people around you may not see you, that even though you may even be living in a house and you wonder, do the people in my house even see me? Then maybe you go to a job or you go to a workplace and you try to do the best you can do and you wonder if anyone there sees you. Luke wants you to know that even though you may go unnoticed by the people who are around you, you do not, even in the middle of a crowd, go unnoticed by our God. That your heavenly father sees you even when we don't. That your father, heavenly father sees you and he sees the day that you've had and he sees the conditions that you are under and he is trying to do something in you but you feel you still come up short. Luke wants us to know that even though the crowd is pressing in, that even though the crowd is so big that everyone's fighting for a piece of attention from Jesus, that he pauses and he sees what no one else sees. Luke says, Jesus saw at the water's edge two boats who were left there by the fishermen. King David needed to know that. 
There's this Psalm, Psalm 139. And if you have not read that Psalm recently, I would encourage you to go home. Just write Psalm 139 down and read it. Read it in every translation you can find. It is one of the most amazing and one of the most encouraging passages of Scripture, I think, in the entire Bible. It's the time when David, I think, is reflecting back on his life. And if you know anything about King David's life, he's had a lot of ups and downs, hasn't he? He has faced war. He has faced a huge accomplishment that he wanted to do. He wanted to be in charge of building the temple, but, for, but, but God didn't allow him to build the temple. He, he allowed, you know, Solomon to build it. There were a lot of things that David wanted to do. So David has this life of ups and he has this life of downs, a lot like you and me. And he gets to Psalm 139 and where he could have been discouraged about the things that were going on. He looks and he writes a Psalm to his heavenly father. And he says these, these almost same words that Luke says when you're wondering if God ever sees you. David looks and he writes, oh God, you have searched me and you know me. He says, God, you not only see me, but you know me. He says, when I get up, you are there. When I lay down, you are still with me. He says, you know my thoughts. And before I speak a word, you already know what that word will be. And then he begins to ask some rhetorical questions. He says, so where could I go from your presence? Or where could I flee from your spirit? They are not questions that he is asking because he's trying to escape the presence of God. They are questions where he is kind of confirming to himself that there is nothing going to happen to him in this life that would take him out of the bounds or or out of the, the framework or out of the hands of his heavenly father. So he encourages himself by saying not really a question, but by, by looking to God and saying, where can I go from your spirit? Or where could I flee from your presence? He says, if I make my, if, if I go and I make my way to the heavens, he said, even there, he says, your right hand will lead me. But what if it's, it's the other extreme and I have to make my bed in the depths of the earth where he says, even there, your right hand will guide me. Anybody have those dark times in your life? Those times when maybe you feel like, Peter, you fished all night and you've come up short. Nothing seems to be going the way you want it to go. The world just feels dark. Well, David must have felt that way because David says, even when at those times in my life when I felt like there was this darkness coming over you, he said, I turn to you. And he said, the darkness was as light before you. And he says, in the middle of the blackness of night, you shine like the morning sun. And then if you skip down to verse 16, I love his next thought. He says, and when I thought no one else was looking at me, when I thought no one else could see me, David makes this a remarkable statement. He says, God saw me even when I was in my mother's womb. (laughs) That before anyone else on earth had laid an eye on you, before there was ever a whatever those things are that they do where they can see inside of you now, and you know, you you can kind of get a 3D picture. God said, let me tell you, I had a 3D picture long before you had a way to make a 3D picture. Listen to how he words it. He says, your eyes saw my unformed body and all the days that I would live were written in your book before a single one of them had come to be. David says, you need to know something. You have a God who not only sees you, you have a God who is intimately acquainted with you. And when your best friend may not see what you're going through, when the people who live in the house with you, when your children, with your spouse, with your friends, when they may not see what's going on, when you go to a work place every day and they see you, but they don't really see you. He said, you can rest assured that even in the middle of a crowd where people are pressing in on Jesus, that he not only sees you, but he knows you. Not long ago, several of us here in the office were making our way. We were going out of the office. We were making our way to our cars, discussing where we were going to eat lunch that, uh, uh, that day. And as we got to the parking lot, it was kind of a hot day. We saw a little tiny baby bird that had fallen, I guess, out of its mother's beak. It didn't even have feathers lit, and it was laying on the hot pavement. Well, 
we didn't know where to pick it up. We started to pick it up and somebody says, don't pick it up. The mother will never come back and get it. And we're thinking, mother's gone anyway. I don't see mother anywhere. And baby bird is here. Well, we ended up putting baby bird over in the grass, hoping that, you know, by some miracle, a vet would find it before a cat found it. And that, that you know, it would maybe live a bit longer, that maybe it could be revived. But somehow we knew that it was on its final leg. But you know what? We saw the bird. We saw the bird because we stumbled across the bird on our way to do something else. There's an incredible story in Matthew 5, 6, and 7 that's kind of associated around the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus looks at some people who are wondering if God sees them. There are people who feel that the religious system has left them behind. There are some people who feel that even the people who lead the religious system have forgotten them, have turned away from them, that they are really of no value because they're just the little people. And to this group of people, Jesus, and that's where in my mind I see them sitting around, he comes on and he says to them when they're questioning, does God see me? He looks and he says, do you not realize that not even a sparrow can fall from the sky? that your heavenly father doesn't see it and know about it and care about it. That when you look up and you see the multitude of birds, especially in the fogs, they migrate their way to warmer places from our air. He said, you may see a hundred and you may see a thousand, you may see a hundred thousand, but I'm going to tell you, Jesus says, that your heavenly father sees every one of them and he sees every one that falls. He would continue that that thought when he tells the people, he says, look out at the fields that are out there. He said, do you see how the flowers are blooming? Do you see how God has made this flower this way and this one unique in this way and how all of these things work together? He then, he says, if your heavenly father so clothes the grasses of the fields and the weeds that are gonna be here today and gone tomorrow, how much more does he love you than them? You see, he wanted to make sure that we knew that God just didn't stumble across us. When Luke writes these words, he saw at the water's edge two boats who were left there by the fishermen. And as you will discover, he saw the fishermen who were there as well. Luke wants us to know that Jesus didn't just stumble across them on his way to do something else. He wasn't going to launch or getting something else when he just happened to cross them like we had done with the bird in the parking lot. No, he saw them. And you know why he saw them? Back up one verse on the screen with me. He saw them because one day as Jesus was standing by the Sea of Galilee, why in the world do you think Jesus was standing by the Sea of Galilee that day? Why in the world do you think Jesus had chosen that day unless Jesus in his sovereignty, unless Jesus in all the fullness of God knew that there was going to be a man standing on the shore who needed to know that God sees him even when his night, even when his day has been a complete failure. You see, I think it is no accident that Jesus was standing by the Sea of Galilee that day because Jesus in his sovereignty knew Because that's what his sovereignty is all about, that he could see the end from the beginning, that he knew that somebody needed him that day. He saw, next verse, at the water's edge, two boats left there by the fishermen, and guess what they were doing? He says, says, they were washing their nets. This is where we gotta kind of wind down this morning, even though we're not through, so we'll finish next week. And why were they washing their nets? They were washing their nets because they were finished. Now they weren't finished forever because just doesn't the fact that they were washing their nets tells you that they weren't quitting for good. They were just quitting for a day. They were quitting for a night. Which tells me that God knows that we have those seasons, that we have those times in our lives where he knows that we need to take a break. That we need to maybe finish for a while. There was a moment in Linda and I, not Linda and I's life, in my young life, I was about 10 or 11, and uh, uh, we were going on a fishing trip with my dad. 
Uh, he had made arrangements for us to go uh, to Destin, Florida. It was just he and I, I thought at that time, I didn't realize there was gonna be a larger group of people who were joining us down there. But I was excited about this fishing trip where, that we were gonna go on to Florida. I had never been deep sea fishing. And as a 10 year old, I thought this was gonna be cool. I had been fishing with my grandmother and I didn't love it so much. And the whole idea of that, I wasn't very patient, but I thought this was gonna be different. And in my mind, the picture I had was that we, that we would be on the back of a boat. There would be these huge cabinets in chairs, we would have a rod, we would put it in this thing here, and we would catch a marlin, and we would be doing this with it, and a swordfish would come jumping out of the water, and that was the picture I had. That was not the vision, that, that, that was not the picture of what actually happened, though. What actually happened was, we left after Dad got off work at the repair station that night, uh, uh, where uh, he was employed, and uh, we left there. We drove all night long. We got into Destin, Florida about 4 a.m. in the morning. We stayed in the car till the fishing boat was ready to, to get on, and we got on the boat. There were a lot of people with Besides us, there were my dad and I, but there were a bunch of people and there were no captain chairs out there on that boat either. And what we were doing, they, they placed us around the deck of the boat when we were able to go on and they gave us an electric rod and reel. I had never had an electric rod and reel before. I didn't even know that an electric rod and reel existed, but you pushed one button and they had a thing and the, the line would drop to a certain depth and you pushed another button and you were, you know, when a fish was on your line and it would, the rod would come up and there would be the fish on the end of the line. And they said, they, they said this is, you know, this is, this is how you fish on this boat. My visions of this and this and a big marlin coming in was kind of gone. And so I'm sitting there and then they made us cut our own bait. We had a little, thing there and it had like a dead fish in it. We had to cut part of the dead fish off to put on the bait for this. It's part of the whole experience and I really wasn't enjoying that cutting the dead fish up to put on this, but I was living through it in my little 10 year old self on this fishing trip that we were, that we had gone on. And well, and my dad was trying to be patient with me, but my 10 year old little body, I was more infatuated with the little buttons that made the line go up and little buttons that made the line go down. So much so that by nine o'clock this morning, I had pulled my line up and down so many times that one of the Deckhands came by and said, you're going to run out the battery on your line if you're not careful. They said, and then this is no lie. This is what he said. I felt like I was in the 60s again, which probably was. I wasn't much out of them anyway, late 60s, early 70s. He goes, you need to be one with the fishing pole. <laughs> he goes, and I, he goes, and as he goes, as you feel the gentle tug of the line, then you know there's a fish on it. Problem was, every time a wave came by the boat, I felt a tug of the line. So I was up and down and up and down, putting all this out there. Dad was trying to be patient with me. It wasn't working out. And by 9 a.m., I had caught nothing. We had been fishing for only an hour. And you know what I was? Every parent's nightmare. I was B-O-R-E-D, bored. <laughs> And while dad was trying to be patient with me, I was thought, oh my heavens, I don't know sure if I like this. I, I like the boat, I like the water, but I did not like standing in one place up and down, up and down with this. Three more hours I did that till lunchtime approached. I looked at dad, he goes, you hungry? And I said, I'm not only hungry, I'm done. <laughs> I'm finished. Now I wasn't finished forever, but I was finished for the moment. And that's where Peter is. He wasn't finished forever but he was finished for the moment. And as I stood there on the shore of that or on the deck of that boat, as I look back on that experience, I think about the time that was there. And I often think about Peter as an old man. Peter's an old man looking back on his life and what he would have given at different places for another four hours with Jesus. We're gonna continue his story next week, but if I could give you anything just about those first two verses in 2022, it would be this. I hope you know that you have a God who sees you, that when nobody else sees you, I hope that you know that you have a God who sees you. I hope that you'll go home and you'll read Psalm 139. And with David, you will come to the point in your life in 2022 where you can look up to God and you can say, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I get up and you know when I lie down. You know my thoughts from afar. How precious are they to me, oh God. If I rise on the wings of the morning, you are there. And if I dwell in the furthermost parts of the earth, even there your right hand will guide me. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works and you know that full well. 
My frame was not hidden from you when I was formed in the deepest places. And you saw my unformed body and you knew the days of my life before a single one of them had come to be. I hope in 2022 that you come to know a God who knows you like that. That he sees you, that he loves you, and he wants to be a part of your life. I pray that in 2022, you come to an understanding of a God who is pursuing you, who is pursuing you. Do you realize God's got a big job to do? <laughs> I mean, he's like running the world. He's like running the universe. And I know sometimes we question, like, well, you know, I, I might have done this a little bit different, that a little bit different, but he's got a big job to do. I mean, he's making sure as we sit here that we're all sitting on this planet without being flung off as it spins around like a hundred million times a, a minute that, we, that we're all sitting right here. But in the midst of all this running the universe, that Luke would remind you and he would remind me that even when the crowds are pressing in and even when any normal person could only see what was right there in front of them or to their left or to their right, that your heavenly father, he saw you even when you didn't see him and that it is no accident that you are here today because his eyes are on you. I hope that in 2022, if you know anything, that you come to know you have a father like that. And that's where we'll pick up next week. Father, I thank you for loving us. I thank you for seeing me even when I don't see you. And that although, Father, I know that there are nights like Peter had where we fish all night and we don't catch anything, I pray that we will come to know that even in those moments that you have not abandoned us, that you have not walked away from us, but that in fact, you were precisely on the shore of our lives, waiting for the moment that we will look back to you, that you were looking for us. Father, I thank you in the midst of what has to be a busy job of running the world, that you take the time to consider each of us, that you chose us and that you wanted us to be yours. I thank you for doing that for us. And I pray, Father, that we will have a 2022 that realizes just how in love with us you really are. And I ask it in the name of Jesus. And the whole church said, amen. Well, hey, whether this was your first time being with us in person or your first time tuning in online, we hope that it was the first of many to come in 2022. If you're brand new with us, we've got a space set up that we would love a chance to meet you. We call it the green room. If you go right out these doors over here and hang a left, you'll find it bright green room. You'll find out what we call it the green room when you get there. But some of our staff and some volunteers will be over there. We'd love a chance to meet you and connect with you. If you didn't get a chance to fill out that digital connection card, especially those of you tuning in, fill that out. Get connected for this new year as we're jumping in. If you're a middle school student, or a high school student, our midweek programming is resuming this week on Wednesday nights at 6.30 right here on our campus. And also, we are looking forward to seeing you tonight at the Rivergate Skate Center for our family decade skate night. So whether you're a 90s baby or if you're more of like a groovy 60s type or even if you want to dress up like a pilgrim, we are good with it. Whatever decade is good with you is good with us. And so we hope to see you and your family tonight to wrap up this whole Christmas break that we have been on tonight. Rivergate Skate Center, I think it's five dollars a person or uh, per skater and so if you want to come out have fun skate around a little bit it'll be a great time you guys have a wonderful rest of your weekend happy new year peace <laughs>